I digitized a bunch of cassette tapes of my playing, and there was some stuff for me at 19 years old, and it sucked. What, what's it like to play the NFL Super Bowl halftime show? I couldn't have been more frightened. Hey there, Sam Ashers, and welcome to the Spotlight. I'm Dave Stutz, and with us today in the Sam Ash studio is a man whose trumpet career has expanded so far in the industry. He's been on countless records, including Bruce Springsteen, also joined the boss himself for the Super Bowl halftime show, and whose work is probably most notably known uh, from all the way back with Max Weinberg and the Max Weinberg 7 to Max Weinberg and the Tonight Show Band, and now Jimmy Vivino and the Basic Cable Band for Conan. It's my pleasure to have in the studio Mark Pender. Hey, Mark, thank what's you going so on, much Dave? All right. Here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, yeah. Absolutely. Do you mind if I start our conversation with just a brief story? Sure. I told you a little bit about it, but I remember as a growing musician, I mean, I've been playing guitar since I was really little, like maybe five or six, but as I started coming into my own in high school, I had a little TV next to my bed, and I remember the last thing I would see before I went to bed was Late Night with Conan O'Brien. I remember the theme song, it's vividly in my head, and you were part of that. I remember your trumpet in that, and so I remember that music, that band Tonight Show music was deeply embedded in my psyche as I was growing as a musician. So for, for your career expanding this far with, with Conan from New York, now out to LA, I mean, what's, what's it like to know that you've had an influence on even someone who doesn't even play trumpet, you know? Well, it's pretty humbling, honestly. Uh, you know, when the show came up, we, we did an audition and we got, the, we got the gig. I mean, I was just blown away by that in the first place. And right. then those early years at late night were, were really magic. And then, you know, somehow the theme got worked where I ended up popping this high G concert at the end of it. And, uh, you know, there were trumpet players who I admired and loved and people coming up after me that they remembered that, you know, that I actually could hit the right. the high G every night. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just have to say thank you for remembering that because of I know course. for me that they were always really, those have been really, these have been just such great years. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to have that kind of run. Uh, we've now been, uh, pretty much everybody in the band has been there with him for 24 years. Wow. And counting. Yeah. Um, still going strong. Still going strong. And how, what trumpet players have that kind of gig? There yeah. really just haven't been that many. Um, I mean, that's just been, it's been a dream. And to, and to hear that there were people coming up behind us that watched it and admired it, it, it really means a lot to me. Absolutely. You know, and you mentioned hitting the high G. You know, last night as I was preparing, I knew you were coming today. I was thinking about other trumpet players that I had encountered. I remember in college, uh, Chris Bodie came and played for us. And I actually wanted to get your opinion. I, I remember sitting in the auditorium, he was playing a set, and all of my friends in the music program who were trumpeters were sitting up near the front. And uh, Chris Brody said, who, who's in here who plays trumpet? And they raised their hands. And he said, all right, how old are you? And I think they're like, oh, I'm 20, I'm 19. And he's like, oh, so you still suck. You're terrible. <laughs> I, I remember he said, you'll never, you'll never reach like, you know, this, not in a very humble way. I'm not saying he was a cocky guy, but he's like, I'm, I'm, I think he was like 40 or 41 at that point. He's like, this is when you'll start coming into your own as a trumpet player. And I was, I was curious about your opinion on that because growing up, you know, it was always, there was the intermediate players and then professional was up here and everyone we knew who was even, you know, famous who played, they kind of fell somewhere in the middle, but professional almost seemed like a higher echelon. And for trumpet, it was always embedded in my head that if you can hit this note right here, you've made it. You are a trumpet player. Th this is what separates the, the intermediate semi-professional to the professionals. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I don't know. I went to the New York Brass Conference, and you just want everybody to stop hitting those high notes. Oh, okay. So I don't know if that necessarily <laughs> makes anybody professional. Fair enough. But, but uh, that being said, I think uh, there are a lot of guys in their early 20s that are just tearing it up, man. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I know for myself, I, uh, I digitized a bunch of cassette tapes of my playing, and there was some stuff for me at 19 years old, and it sucked. Mm. And I thought it was good at the time. Right. Quite a few of them, in fact. Uh, cut to two years later, I just moved to New York and was working for Charles Erlen, and 
I didn't even know who that guy was anymore. Oh, right. And I think that guy might even play better than I do now, <laughs> at least for some things. For playing right. that kind of jazz, he certainly does. Mm. Uh, so, but yeah, I think there's something that goes along with all that time and experience and, and if obviously meeting people. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I've been really fortunate to play with so many varied type of musicians and get to hang out with them and learn from them that uh, where my journey began is doesn't look like how I imagined it to turn out. Right. Uh, because I got to play with all these incredible people. Right. I, you know, uh, started out in the full, first full-time job in an 18-piece big band, joining Charles Erlin in an organ trio kind of thing, soul jazz, and always in funk bands and everything, then to playing rock with Southside Johnny and uh, Little Steven and the Disciples of Soul and, and, uh, and finally Bruce Springsteen and watching all those guys work. Like Southside Johnny has this incredible creative outlook on music and Bruce Springsteen does too. His creative process is just, I learned from all that. So I don't play like I did when I was a kid, and I think probably for Chris Bode it was a lot like that too, because I remember doing sessions with him when before he was Chris Bode. Right. Uh, my nickname for him was Brisket. <laughs> really? Yeah, because I thought he was from? I thought he was good and meaty. Oh, nice. Nice meaty player. Classic. Awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the the nickname uh, stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's really interesting to hear that. You know, you you look at like Lady Gaga and people like this who do the Super Bowl halftime show, and they make it sound like that's the pinnacle of their career. Nothing will quite be the same as doing this show. What, what's it like to play the NFL Super Bowl halftime show? Was it, was it that huge of an experience for you guys? Wow, yeah, I think it was. Uh, first of all, you know you grow up with that, the Super Bowl. I'm a big football fan. There you go. Here's your uh, team. Kansas, Kansas City, City Chiefs. Got to be, right? There you go. Uh, <laughs> Chiefs. Uh, so when Bruce asked us to do it, uh, you know, I was obviously, for a number of reasons, really wanted to do it. Right. But then there's the day of the show. We get there. We hit, we're next to the field just minutes before they're getting ready to build the stage that they build in, like, commercial breaks. Yeah. And... I couldn't have been more frightened. Really? You know, After first all of these all, years and all that experience. All these years, all that experience. Because people say things when you're there, like, "Well, this is going to be over a hundred million people watching." Right. And it was difficult for me to fathom. Wow. So if you screw up. Right. It's forever. It's forever. Yeah. And also, you're in front of like eighty-five, ninety thousand people, which is intimidating enough. Right. Let alone the hundred million. And we had not rehearsed with the pyro either. Ooh. And the pyro they told us was right in back of us. Right. So you just have to know it's coming. You just that sounds yeah. terrifying. It, it, but I was more terrified just the whole scope of the thing. And I remember just being so nervous. And and I think I think Bruce was too, from my recollection. Mm. But then something happened at the last minute. This is going to be a moment of your life that you're always going to remember. You may never, ever get to play the Super Bowl again. Go out there and have fun. Right, try to enjoy it. Just go out and put everything into it and enjoy it. And as soon as Bruce counted off the tune, I was there. Well, isn't uh, there always something about that first note that kind of, like, I know you go in nervous, but something about the first few notes, the first song, it, it all just kind of melts away. And I think I've always had performance anxiety, you know, uh, musically, that is. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fair enough. You know, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's a strange thing. You know, I mean, you you came from a, a similar kind of a small town background. You know, and you're, uh, I never really quite got used to. You know, I'm nervous before playing in front of a small group of people or, or a very large group of people, right. almost the same, almost pretty much the same. But then once I get started. Uh, you know, I've never wanted to do anything else, and I don't, there's no, I, actually not a way that I could love doing something more than I love doing this. Right. Uh, sure. And, you know, every day we do our Conan show, the warm-up, you know, there's between two and three hundred people there, and they're screaming and everything, and 
before, usually I'm a little bit nervous. But once we hit the stage, it's, mm -hmm. wow, okay. This yeah. is a lot of fun. I love doing it. Right. Uh -huh. I got to say, I was, I was fortunate enough to see a taping of Conan, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. But that was another question that I, I've always been curious about for, for you know, talk show bands. What's like the re rehearsal schedule like? When do you guys rehearse? How often do you play together before that show? It varies. Uh, most days, uh, it's, it's uh, around noon. Okay. Uh, we get together with the, the rest of the guys in the band. We talk down everything we're going to play for the day. We do all of our precise count-offs. Mm. So we know if we're playing, you know, the first commercial break, the count-off is 2-3, or the count-off is 3-4, right. or 1-2 drum fill. Right. You know, because those things are going to help us to all be on the same page. We're not going to guess at that point, the, probably the most important point, Mm -hmm. of the of the entrance of every song the beginning because that's the easiest place to screw it up right uh, and we go through you know we pull up all of our music and then we'll play a few things usually mm -hmm. and then we go out and we are there for comedy rehearsal okay so anything we need to play during comedy rehearsal we play and Conan loves to strap on his guitar and we usually jam with him every day nice which has always been you know that's I mean, cool. You have to think that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, then we take a break, make up, get dressed, pre-show pre warm up, uh, and then into the show. Right. And uh, on other days, if we play with a guest band, we're there maybe at ten. Okay. I you understand. Know, to do all the run-throughs, the rehearsal with the guest band, and then continue. Then there are some days that we're just needed earlier, so we'll show up earlier. The whole week at the Apollo, I think we were in between 9 and 10. Okay. So you rehearse every day? We rehearse every day. We do. Uh, how, how much time does that leave you to do, you know, other gigs, like, you know, playing with Bruce or anything like that? You know, how does that usually work? Well, since I moved out to the other coast, I'm not playing with him as, as often as I'd like. Okay. Uh, the logistics of it don't make it that easy. He used to act, sometimes personally call my house and ask me to come down, come down and record something. Nice. Uh, but that's not going to happen in L.A. Yeah. Um, but it does leave a decent amount of time. It's a four-day-a-week schedule. Um, I had a lot more stuff going on in New York because I lived here longer. Uh, I know a lot more people. But now it's been building over the last few years in L.A., and I'm starting to do a lot more outside work. I've had my own band at... Uh, it's like a rhythm and blues kind of project. And then there's La Bamba, Pender Band. the Mark Pender Band. We also, uh, uh, La Bamba and the Hubcaps, you know, I'm part of that. I, you know, sing and front a few songs with him. Right. Uh, and then there's some other bands, the guys from the Royal Crown Review I'd played with, uh, the Jennifer Keith uh, Quartet, Quintet, Sextet when I'm there. Uh, you know, and then there's, you know, all these other people I, I just love playing with uh, that I get opportunity to play with out there. And that's that grows. It's you know once again, it's all about relationships, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. So, uh, it, it isn't really even about the reputation. It's more about this right. kind of relationship development. Sure. That was a surprise to me, career-wise. Right. The, that you think once you get to a certain level, everybody wants you, but in the end, it's it for me it, personally, it's always just been about one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships with folks. Sure. That's yeah. great. Now you, you mentioned comedy rehearsal. I think I know what that is, but just to clarify, this is when in the show you'll grab a mic and wander into the crowd for a bit. Well, there's that and then whatever comedy that the show is going through. Usually it's whatever is on the grid. Okay. So whatever's being rehearsed for that day, we, we're there for it in case they need music mm -hmm. or, you know, just to see what it looks like, see what it sounds like. I see. And obviously if we're in something, then, uh, you know, then too, I think the last thing I did was that uh, I got dunked into a tub of uh, of uh, dye uh, to paint my head like an Easter egg. I think I remember that. Yeah, how was that? That sounds, you know, I'll do what I have to do, but okay. <laughs> it was funny as heck. Uh, okay. But uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy being lifted by a couple of guys and. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Dunked in. 
Quite a day, quite a good day. <laughs> yeah, just another day at work for you. It was right? a great day at work, yeah. Do. <laughs> so I mentioned I, I was fortunate enough to see a taping of Conan. This would have been, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, but during the commercial breaks, you don't just sit there. Things happen for, for the audience that's there that doesn't happen for the audience who watches at home. And it usually heavily has to do with the band. I got to hear a lot of the band while I was there. And... I remember a, a certain cadence went off and then the band started chanting, hold that note, hold that note. And I saw <laughs> one of the most impressive things I've ever seen that I had heard about when you're in school, there, there's the legend of circular breathing, but no one knows how to do it in school. So it almost sounds like a myth. But I remember you held a note longer than I had ever seen a human being ever play a note. I mean, what, what is that like to, to do that? Because just thinking about it makes me exhausted to, to think about how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a pretty good uh, gimmick, I guess you could call it. Uh, but uh, it does need to be learned. Sure. Uh, and I, I think I learned, I saw uh, Count Basie band, uh, no, Duke Ellington, Mercer Ellington Orchestra with Paul Gonzalez on tenor saxophone. And he played a cadenza at the end of a, mm. at the end of a song, and he didn't stop for breath. And I totally right. lost it yeah. and decided I was going to go home and figure it out. And you know, I locked myself in a room and for hours, and I did figure it out. And it took me a while to perfect it after that. But uh, so you are breathing in and out slightly. Mm. Okay. So while air is still coming out, you're breathing in a little bit, and you know. I think during the show, it's like two to four minutes I'll hold the note. Yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's something to see. It definitely works. And, and the other thing about when I do it at the show is that we have these wireless microphones. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I understand Sam Ash makes a really good wireless microphone. We, we, we do. Our, our company, <laughs> Samson, makes one. <laughs> but uh, so we're wireless, and I'm running through the crowd. I sing the song going up and down stairs. And then I hit a place, and I hold the note. So at that point, my heart is beating like, you know, 120 beats a minute right. already, yeah. and I'm starting to hold the note. That's, right. the, only, that's the one factor that makes it uh, a little bit like uh, exercise. Sure. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, it, this takes some physical effort. Nice. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. So, Mark, we're lucky enough to have you here at Sam Ash. Obviously, you can imagine we're gear people. You know, we, we love new gear, vintage gear. We're just gear people. Do you ever find, you know, as a guitar player, it's very easy to wander into a store and look at the new guitars and play them and want them and stuff like that. As a trumpet player, do you like to go out and check out gear and look at the stores and see what's new? Or It's a little bit of an illness with me, yeah. Okay. I, uh, you know, going into a music store, and especially Sam Ash. Nice. Uh, that one in, in Midtown Manhattan. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, you, you could spend the day, you know, in the horn area with the sheet music and all the accessories and everything. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I never got over feeling like I did when I was in middle school. Yeah. When when you first go into a, right. a music store and you you start playing a, a, mm -hmm. a instrument, and I first started playing a horn, and you know, got my first professional horn, and right. you know, the experience it never stopped being exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Thirty Fourth Street store, it's it's definitely our flagship shop because it it has such a a huge history in New York City. It used to be on Music Row, which is 48th Street, which had Manny's and Rudy's and, and, and all these places. And since we've moved over to 34th between 8th and 9th across from Penn, but it's, yeah, it's, it's one of our favorite shops as well. And speaking of gear, uh, we definitely want to know, you know, what are, what are you playing these days? What you got in front of you? Well, these, uh, I'm playing the uh, B&S Challenger trumpet Great. Uh, from Buffet Crampon. Nice. Uh, I've been playing them for 20 years now. 20 years. Yeah. So that's been your your working trumpet. That's your daily driver. This is the daily driver, uh, and wouldn't want to show up on a gig without it. Okay. Why is that? I don't think there's another trumpet that plays as well as this out there. Wow. Uh, I'd been a Bach man. Mm -hmm. I'd played Bach for a long time, and I was asked to try this uh, to try the Challenger. And uh, honestly, I thought it was a bunch of BS <laughs> to try the BNS uh, right. because I thought there's no way that I would ever switch horns right. uh, because I'm kind of a, a creature of habit. 
uh, when it came to the horn. It's something so personal, you put your face on it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so then I tried the horn. It was actually brought over to our rehearsal at Conan. I played it in our dressing room. I went to our rehearsal room and played it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is really crazy because this horn is playing better than the one you already have. Mm. So I put the Bach underneath the music stand and I took this out because I was afraid. Like in the yeah. heat of battle, it's always different than when you're playing a horn that's... Absolutely. Uh, you know, you play it for a few minutes, you can play it in an empty room, it sounds like one thing. Mm -hmm. But when you're out there with an audience in a big room, I, I played the B&S, the Challenger, uh, and I never stopped playing it after that. Okay. I eventually took the other horn and put it in its case, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been playing them ever since. That's great. What a what a what a rich legacy. What kind of, I mean, is it is it about tone? Is it about playability? Is it all of that? Well, I think it it comes down, and people love this type of concept now. It came down to craftsmanship. Right. Did I say that right? Craft craftsmanship. You hit it perfect. Woo! That's the word. So these guys that are making these things had been making them for you know decades and decades right. and they had a way of doing it much more uh, handmade uh, and what ended up happening is the horn was very free-blowing mm -hmm. it vibrated in areas that other horns didn't oh interesting uh, and I got a great range and a great tone out of it it wasn't shrill mm. it came out very full um, and I just fell in love with it. Okay. And, and, and like I said, I've been playing them ever since. Now, did you find any like new nuances, anything that you felt like, wow, I can get, you know, this color that maybe I've never had that color before? Is it, is it that kind of thing? Well, I have, I have switched, uh, B and S trumpets. Okay. Uh, so now I'm playing the silver and I said, I'd never play a silver. Why is that? Just tone? No, I hate to have to clean it. Yeah. It's, and I'm, as you I'm can see, you. I'm completely comfortable with it being dirty now. Yeah. Because it plays so well. Yeah. Absolutely. I finally just stopped caring about that. But for a long time, I played the, the uh, gold lacquered horn, looked incredible, played incredible, uh, and I played the brass also. And those played, and I always loved brass. Like I said, I didn't feel like I had to wipe it down. You know, I've, I've kind of, I think, been primarily known not as a jazz player, but more as a guy who plays in rock bands and right. and TV bands and stuff like that. So I, I do need a different type of equipment. And this, you know, I always tell everybody, I'm not the best trumpet player in the world, but I might be the loudest. Nice. And uh, <laughs> this horn doesn't take anything away from that. Great. It has a big, round, full tone, but I can also make it, I can also give up a lot of high end with it. Mm. It sounds like a trumpet. There you go. You know, I mean, uh, and, and, and honestly, nobody's making them better. And, and I truly believe that. I always go down to the trade shows reluctantly. Nobody wants to go to those things. The trade shows can be tough. Yeah, no, they're fun, though. They right. are fun. But, but what I do get to see is I see a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time, but I also get to try whatever is out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these horns are really great. Uh, yeah. And not well known in the U.S. Sure. Uh, they'd had a long history in, in Europe. Um, so I think that people are getting more and more, are learning more and more about them. And as a result, also, I think that their price point hmm. is quite a bit lower than some of the other brands. Sure. Uh, but the quality is there. Right. So it just sounds like it, it helps you play better, play easier. You know, it, it, it helps you get to where you used to go just a little bit better, a little bit easier. Sure. If I had a session or something come up or a big concert, I wouldn't want to play any other horn. Great. The other thing is, so I, I told you guys this story before. So I went to Jacksonville and I tried out 25 BNS Challengers. They wanted me to write something on a card about each one of them. 25 trumpets. Yeah. Wow. That's a little bit of a long morning. That's a daunting task. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of blowing and tubing. Right. Uh, 
So I told myself when I went down there that I did, was not going to come home with a new trumpet. Right. It's just, don't do it. It's just stupid. It's don't do it. You it. don't need another trumpet. That's right. You don't need to buy any more equipment. Yeah. You have plenty of trumpets. Then this was one of the 25. Nice. Like the one. This is the one, and they it didn't was give silver. give you another model. This was one of the 25. This is one of the 25, but they all came out of their cases and played great. Wow. And this one played better than any of the others that I had ever played. So at that point, I felt obligated to take it home. Sure. I mean, you have to. You kind of have know, to. It's, it's not up to you at that point. At that point, it's not up to you. Yeah. It's, it's a higher power directing you to do the right thing. But what a testament to consistency, you know, and because it's it's one thing to have amazing quality craftsmanship, but time and time again, hitting the mark every single time. And for each of those to come out of the case, nothing special, no work done. You didn't have to take it to a tech. Just right, right no out of the modifications. Case, they, they all played great. No modifications. Uh, That's and, awesome. And, and I love that about them uh, because I know a lot of other horns, you know, guys like to modify them. Yeah. And I never felt like modifying. I did ask to not have the first valve ring on there. Okay. That's, that's the only thing that I, I, you know, I grew up in an era where we didn't have them. Right. So but I, that, I like feeling the horn close. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that wouldn't affect, like, tone or playability. Oh, God, That's no. just a personal preference. No, that's just a personal preference. That's hardly even a modification, really. It's I mean, not it a is, modification. But... It's just removing the ring. Right. Uh, but it's not, like, you know, switching lead pipes around or... Uh, right. you know right. putting a different bell on or anything yeah. like that it was you know this is a medium large bore horn that plays great out of the box literally right. out of the box nice yeah so mark having the job that i have and doing what i do has has always been a really cool experience because i get to meet a lot of cool people people i grew up listening to and admiring but then every once in a while you you meet someone or encounter someone that just has that much more weight to it. You were absolutely the first trumpeter I ever admired. You know, watching Late Night with Conan O'Brien meant more to me growing up than a lot of things. So it's it's on days like today that I'm, I'm truly blessed to do what I do. So I really appreciate you being here. I want to thank our friends at, our mutual friends and vendors at Buffet Crampon for making this happen. It's always nice to have mutual friends. It is. And, it uh, is. you know. Hope to have you back sometime. Thank well, you thank so much you. for that, being here. That really means a lot, and I appreciate you meeting with me today. Absolutely. Thanks right. again. So we're going to let you go out and play a few notes for us, which we're so grateful for. But uh, once again, we thank you for being here. I'm Dave Stutz. This is Mark Pender, and we'll see you next time on The Spotlight.
right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's the easy part, you know? It's all that talking that's the hard part.